And this sound is all over the Mandalorian soundtrack and all of the film composers sort of work. And depending on where you place your finger, you can get different tones. You can't predict what the tone is going to be, so it's not like you, the composer can say, please bow a cymbal at A flat. Uh -huh. But you can get more precise tones to speak through. And then, once our favorite tool, we can create vibrato. So, you can imagine the Star Wars fleet flying by, you know. My name is Ross Carr, and this is Living the Classical Life. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for having me in your studio. Yeah. So having a look just a little bit more in depth at, at what you demonstrated earlier, I, I can't help but think that all these creative objects that you have in some cases found or you know come up with some sort of sequence, doesn't this change the way you look at the entire world? I mean, <laughs> don't, don't you, do you just go around hitting random things and seeing, I wonder what that sounds like? Yes. <laughs> so the short answer to the question is absolutely yes. I often carry around some friction items like these super ball mallets and just to see what what's out there and, and then bring the fundamental construction of that back into the studio. So if it's a fence, a chain link fence or a barbed wire fence and, and I notice that the tension on the metal is just a certain way, maybe I can bring that inside and show it to a composer and then they take it and run with it. And I mean, I think looking at the world as a potential sound maker, that every, every surface is a, a potential sound maker, every object, it changes the way you exist. It's I mean, pretty delightful. Probably your life is sort of a series of eureka moments where you take an object that you, you know, is part of your everyday life and then you suddenly try something with it and you say, I, I need that. Totally. Sometimes the composer will, will I, I will be thinking in too narrow a way, thinking that I know every sound that could be possible and the composer will say, well, have you tried that and that? And it's like, oh, you got me. I haven't tried that. And therefore, there's a whole new uh, possibility or a set of possibilities that comes from combining this and that. And I think that that's one of the things that's most interesting about uh, the new era of percussion is that it doesn't have to be an instrument before it becomes a concert hall sound maker. Um, the, the connection between the everyday and the, and the concert hall is immediate now, and it's accepted, and people look to it. Even in pop culture like Stomp and other troops that, that use... Um, uh, everyday objects as sound makers. It's kind of a household concept and every kid plays with pots and pans as a way of making sound. This is just, you get to do that in a very intentional and careful and kind of research oriented way. This is from Germany, it's called a Waldteufel um, and it has a goat skin head so it's a little bit louder. Higher pitch. And it's just fishing line. So a lot to do there. So if I'm trying to relate this to what I do as a pianist, mm -hmm. I'm trying to draw the connections. Okay, you you have, you know, these these metal bars, you have the bouncy ball sort of stabbed in the middle, you've got a comb. Mm -hmm. How do you notate all of that? Yeah. Um, or do you need to? Uh, the composer can give a lot of agency to the percussionist to to make a sound world, as opposed to this specific timbre at this specific volume, at this specific time, which is what notation serves, uh, that's what notation does, coordinate all of those elements in volume and time. You can just say, you know, create the sound of a swamp, and then we can pull out that sound, you know, of the Waldteufel, and, 
and, and then just make that happen over this duration. And so oftentimes percussionists are just given a basic prompt mm -hmm. and a timeline in which to do it. Um, and sometimes it's truly as precise as, mm -hmm. you know, the fifth tine on the comb is C sharp and we use a conventional Western notation system and we remap it to the specifics of the object. So sometimes it's ultra precise, like this tine at that time, this volume with this microphone or whatever. And sometimes it's like, okay, here's a comb, just make a sound effect. So the hair comb um, doesn't make much sound when it doesn't have a resonator, mm -hmm. it's still a sound. But when you put it, for example, in the styrofoam, like we did with the rebar, you get a completely different world. It's almost like a microtonal kalimba or mira, um, but just a cheap hair comb. I got this at the dollar store in 45th Street in Brooklyn, and it just makes a cool sound. So it's a cool sound, but then it can also be an expressive sound once you've figured out what, it's, what makes it tick. So we have low sounds and high sounds. So you can create this kind of environmental cricket impersonation, but also you know, you can control it just like you could an Ambira. Um, but it doesn't do much unless you have that resonator. Hmm. Same thing if you filter it through a metal sound. So um, often the composer will make a guess as to how to express something in notation. And the percussionist will say, well, well that's not exactly how I would do so. Like, re remake their own part with their own instincts. But there's not a conventional system for it. That's, I think, the surprising thing for folks is that there is no convention for percussion notation at all. It's reinvented for every new piece. Percussionists become good at figuring out what the legend of the notation systems are. Like, it's an X, so it means this. But in the next piece, it's going to be a circle. You know, <laughs> there's no there's no convention at all. It sounds like that's a lot of work to realize the compositions of others, and yeah. I, I I feel like collaborating with with composers is almost a form of creating the work. Do you do any composition yourself? No, um, I am not uh, shy about the the pieces where a composer says, "Well, I you know I don't really know how to notate this, so you just go for it," and and. Yeah, then there's an improvisatory, extemporaneous compositional quality, which I'm happy to do. I'm not going to then fight to put my name in the upper right corner of the page or anything, but um, I, I appreciate the faith that composers have in performers to improvise in passages of a piece or to, you know, to bring their own identity to the stage. I didn't realize that there was actually room for improvisation in the world of, of percussion. It's interesting because percussion is super old, of course. The, the oldest sounds are probably voice and percussion. And, but in terms of the percussion that, um, that we studied here at Oberlin Conservatory, or uh, that, I don't know how to describe it, that the percussion craft that um, comes from the orchestral, Western orchestral tradition, its solo practice is new. It's only from the 1950s and, and newer than that. And I'm definitely acknowledging that there's percussion, solo percussion practices that precede that by hundreds and thousands of years. But this craft is somewhat new relative, to, it's almost like the age of the saxophone or something. And so as a new instrument, we are um, constantly reinventing what it is that we do. Uh, and I think that's a positive thing. And there was an article in the New York Times, I think it was 15 years ago, um, percussionists are the new violinists. Oh. And, and we, all, we all sort of, you know, it was about the so percussion quartet and the success of percussionists because it is true that it wasn't until the mid 90s and after that a percussion quartet would get booked at major festivals for the same fee as the Kronos Quartet would get booked. Well, it's, it's cool. I was wondering because we even just took these two objects, um, this... That's a symbol, right? Yep, yeah. So the symbol and the comb, you showed me that there were so many different ways that those two objects can interact to create a whole range uh, of, of sounds. But if I'm, if I'm zooming out uh, again to just sort of try to frame a context in, mm -hmm. in terms of how we would use these types of sounds, whether in a composition or whatever the purpose may be, mm -hmm. if we relate these sounds to something we already know, when, when, when you were tapping these metal bars, mm -hmm. to me that somewhat evoked the gamelan. Yeah. But 
You also pointed out to me that this is quite different. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to express uh, tones, but what's most interesting for, about, for me about found percussion is that, like I was describing before, this, this rebar isn't cut to a specific length, or rather Home Depot cut it to whatever, 18 inch length, for the convenience of the, of the, of the construction worker. So what we get is the, the random tone that comes out but also 15 other tones in the spectrum that are in that, that, that piece of rebar. It's the richness of that timbre that I think people hear most. It's a completely different sound from in the air or even just holding it very carefully. Nothing compared to this. So this wow. styrofoam creates quite an amplification phenomenon. So I think composers often listen like, oh, oh that's, there's a little bit of this tone and a little bit of that tone, but I think what people hear, the general audience person, is this kind of um, clock. They, they immediately have a kind of image for what that is, but they probably aren't picturing a wooden stick hitting a piece of rebar. So I, I love that relationship of the, the, the richness of the timbre has, it evokes some sort of memory for everybody. And whether it's a gamelan or a grandfather clock, um, it creates a story. And that's, that's what we get to do then is create environments and stories from all these, these sounds, and, and they can be as simple as pieces of metal rods or as complex as the interior of a grandfather clock. But they, they all do a, a similar thing, which is to um, surprise people and, and get them curious about, oh, how did that happen? What's that sound? And that's a great place to be in as an artist. Mm -hmm. to evoke curiosity. So I guess some of that awareness comes off of what we've been conditioned to think about a sound. I mean, for me, when I hear, hear these sounds, I think of something vaguely Eastern, mm -hmm. maybe something Javanese, not that I'm super familiar with that area of the world, but I already have an association with that. Earlier, I was telling you that I, I love and gravitate towards sounds that are supposedly creepy, but I mean, how does that even happen? I mean, who decides yeah. that something's creepy or, or not? I mean, that, that, that's a, when I do these workshops for children, uh, someone, a kid might often say, oh, it sounds like a horror film, or it sounds like a specific film. Like, let's say it sounds like Stranger Things or something. And, and so what they're often doing is relating it to a specific thing that came before. So it's not that there's uh, an inherent haunted quality to the sound of the stick on the cymbal. But if you pulled the audience, they might all think that sounds like a squeaky door. Squeaky doors are creepy. Somehow the origin of the um, discomfort that comes from a squeaky gate or a squeaky door blowing in the wind on its own, that's, it's the story that's making it creepy, not the sound itself. So I think that there's a nurture and nature quality there. Um, which I'm very interested in, and I don't know which it is. I mean, I'm not a, a sort of a cognitive scientist or anything like that, but for, when, when we can re, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We can actually reclaim some of these sounds from the creepy to be in a new space of openness and, and maybe it's actually happy to have that stick sound on the cymbal. That's an interesting thing too. You can recontextualize these sounds and find new, new spaces for them. But until then, I'm also okay with the idea that <laughs> they are creepy uh, to, to most listeners, and it's a mystery as to why. The bouncy ball uh, essentially forms a friction relationship with the drum head, and then it can sing like this. Pretty wild, That's right? an incredibly intense sound, just yeah. resonating. You know where I know I've, I've heard this sound before is uh, in Titanic when the ship is going down. Totally. They add all these resonating frequencies and I always wondered how yeah. they get that. Now the practice of film foley and where it sort of interacts with the soundtrack is something that percussionists are interacting with a lot. I work a lot with the film composer named Ruichi Sakamoto and he asks me frequently to, to send a specific kind of sound for an anime film that he's scoring. And so I'll go into my studio and he prompts me with something like, I would like something that's wind sound, but also nostalgic. And then we just send sounds back and forth until, until we have what he needs. So it can convey a kind of emotional or environmental space. It's like a boat sinking, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or it can also be very expressive and communicative. One of the things I like to talk about on the show is performance. Mm -hmm. And even just these objects in front of us, 
the, the variety of them, the, the number of different objects that you have to interact with, say in sequence for yeah. a piece, um, that probably takes a lot of concentration, practicing the sequencing. I mean, this is not just music making. This, this is almost, you know, choreography mm -hmm. as well. The um, kinetic or ergonomic um, quality of percussion is a, is a really important thing that we practice a lot. And um, the way we practice it is by figuring out how a, a, a stick can strike a surface or rub on a surface, so friction or stroke, and where on the object we need to hit, and with what velocity, what pressure, all of those things speak to that specific sound. But we don't often talk about how hard it is to get from this sound to that sound, recalibrate the forces to make it sound like these two metal things should be struck together. I know I'm gonna put more weight behind this because it needs more weight to activate the vibration and less weight behind that. And so we try things out and immediately the brain knows, okay, that takes a lighter touch, that takes a heavier touch. And then all of that just happens in real time because percussionists practice that control uh, and the recalibration of, of how you strike, what level of force is, whether it's just the weight of the stick or you're using the weight of your whole forearm all of that's not that different than ways that a string player might calculate all of these nuances and sensitivities in their bow grip. We do the same thing. Um, and then we have the rest of the calculations are, well, it's actually not wood that we want striking this. We want something that's rubber, something that's soft, and to get a completely different timbre or volume. And so in the end, the nuances available to us are slightly more raw, more elemental, we make direct approaches to our instruments. Whereas with the piano, you have that large technology between you and the, and the string, which is nice. And I'm jealous of it on many occasions. But for us, that raw elemental quality of directly striking surfaces is met with uh, the nuance of having practiced how to make the stick behave the way we want it to um, when coming into contact with something. So that's our, that's our craft, and, and it's a, a, a constantly evolving one because the composer might say, well, now you're gonna have to hit this really narrow piece of rebar, <laughs> you know? So then we, we get more precise and more, more technical. Is it possible to do this type of practicing mentally? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that there's this particular type of headspace, so yeah. let's say it's the night before your performance totally. and you have a mega complex score that you have. Mm -hmm. Are you actually literally visualizing this setup, if that happens to be it, and then you can you can practice what goes where yeah. in, in sequence. I mean, is, is that, or is that already instinctual for it? There is some, there's a lot of instinct, um, but the first work of the percussionist is usually logistical, and, and it might be a um, process of sitting down with the score and really reckoning the difference between the composer's instinct of how these sounds were gonna happen in sequence versus the way that they can actually happen. So we first do that, and then, yeah, let's say we're on the plane, and it's the night before, we've done a lot of practicing, but in many cases, percussionists never have the opportunity to set up the whole configuration. So you, you just set up a little part of the setup and just practice that, and then you're maybe at the dress rehearsal before you have the final instrument configuration. And it's usually rented from a company, you've never played those instruments before, you're not usually, so Evelyn Glennie or Colin Curry, people that do a lot of concerto solo work, We'll, we'll borrow instruments from the, from the orchestra, so they've never played them before until the night of the show or the dress rehearsal. Um, in working for Aspen Music Festival for a bunch of summers as a, a kind of employee moving percussion equipment, I was always amazed at how the really good percussionists there could jump from this xylophone to that xylophone with no hesitation. But that's something that we build up, is this kind of flexibility, recalibration of what we need um, from instrument to instrument. And then the, the practice we do in the hotel room is, I mean, it's, it's kind of embarrassing looking if you, if you, uh, if you were to come in to, to a, a, the lounge of the orchestra room, you might see a percussionist actually like counting themselves and picking up the stick and putting it down and picking up the next stick and putting it down to practice the transitions um, between the different types of mallets and, and parts of the instruments they have to play so that that part's very smooth. <laughs> this is the only thing you can do away from the instrument is practice the interstitial moves and choreography, like you said. If I'm comparing what I do, I'm always practicing one type of instrument, more That's or true. less. I mean, I'm, I'm jumping maybe, being maybe some grands, grands and yeah. maybe, and there, there are some differences in how to adapt to that. However, even just looking around at your studio here, the, the range of instruments, I'm thinking, how do you 
divide up your time? How, how do percu percussionists tend to divide up their work? I, I see some of these mm -hmm. would probably take more daily work and yeah. others maybe less. So the, there's that old thing about 10,000 hours and how that can create a kind of a virtuosic relationship to instruments. And percussion pedagogues, especially the ones that I studied with, and um, Amy Lynn Barber at Interlochen and, and Michael Rosen here at Oberlin Conservatory, and then Steve Schick, who teaches at University of California in San Diego, um, they all approach the instruments from the concept of touch and tone that comes from the stick and the arm and the body. No matter what's being struck, you're going to focus on how best to uh, relate those two forces. So what that cultivates is a transferable set of skills. So when you're on marimba, you're playing a certain way. When you move to vibraphone, you only have to make a subtle adjustment. That's kind of like, I would guess, moving from organ to harpsichord is pretty drastic, but nevertheless, the, the notes are similar in width and there's some relationship, right? The keyboard readers can understand the, the layout. And then, you know, the other more bespoke instrumental combinations, which we call multi-percussion, um, do require a, special, a specialized practice method. Um, but it's not like we have to spend 10,000 10, hours per 10,000 instruments, you know? It, it isn't, it, we do have transferable <laughs> skills. But oftentimes, um, we find ourselves on a specialized path. So I would be the first to say that I'm not gonna, going to play timpani with the Detroit Symphony tomorrow. The timpanists play timpani with the Detroit Symphony or the Cleveland Orchestra. And, and that specialization is something that happens kind of organically. You find yourself in this gig and then that gig, and eventually you become a specialist in this area. And this is my specialty, keyboard, percussion, marimba, vibraphone, multi-percussion. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't know how to play the timpani. But it's a little bit probably like harpsichord, piano, organ, and there's a huge difference between these, but you could get around on all of them and have things to say about them. Does the typical timpanist, since I don't really know how these things are delineated, does the typical orchestral timpanist also play marimba or vice versa if we're talking about specialties? Each timpanist will have a different relationship to how often they're asked to play keyboard percussion. And so uh, most percussionists play all of the stuff all the time. You know, in, in the classical percussion sphere, you're one day playing timpani and then you're in an orchestra pit playing drum set, an orchestra pit on drum set or uh, playing hand drums and you're just kind of whatever's asked, you can do it. And everyone has that, all professional percussionists have that facility across the range. But then as you hyper-specialize, you might play the other things less and less. And I'd be from, I can only speak from my perspective, but as I hyper specialize in contemporary music, that's still a broad sphere because there's plenty of timpani parts in contemporary music. And the group that I play with, the International Contemporary Ensemble, um, and playing with them for 11 years, I've probably played, uh, you know, 50 timpani parts because there's substantial timpani writing in new music. But more often than that, I'm bowing a cymbal with a contrabass bow and a cymbal. So that's, that's a, a something that comes organically through what composers want to hear. And so my specialization is not really something that I chose, but rather I'm get asked to do this and asked to do that, and then eventually you kind of find your specialization. I hope that makes sense. You talked about the International Contemporary Ensemble. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a setup like this mm -hmm. and the sounds that can be created, putting it into a context of a concept for a program mm -hmm. and, and deciding, you know, how do you decide what can go together for a program that people will want to come to? I mean, is it, do you have an expected audience that is open-minded to everything or do you, do you need to kind of pro project something to make it more accessible? So that's, a, that's a great question. I think in two, uh, two topics, one is how does one create an interesting concert experience? Um, so make a good program, curate an interesting uh, complement of, of composers and their backgrounds and, and the sounds that they want to hear. And then how does the audience relate to that? I found, you know, in 11 years and something like a thousand concerts of almost all world premieres, you don't have the luxury of knowing whether the audience is going to like it or not. Um, but that taste question is, is rarely why someone uh, never comes to a contemporary music concert again. What I find is that accessibility is, um, 
is really just a byproduct of generosity. Mm -hmm. So if you're generous on the stage, even with the most um, unconventional sounds, things farthest away from what people are uh, expecting to hear in a classical music concert, if you're generous with that and, and talking about it before and after the concert, even during the concert, oh, bringing people into your world so that you can cultivate a bit of empathy, um, accessibility becomes a non-issue. And I've never, we've never had experiences where uh, audiences feel alienated by what we're doing, at least in conversation with them after. It's like, oh, that was very interesting how this sound happened, or that was, that was a really difficult piece for me, here's why, and now we're having a conversation. So if anything, contemporary art, especially theater, dance, and music, it's, it's, it can be provocative. It's a provocational gesture to do something new that no one's ever heard before, no one's ever seen before. But audiences are there for it. They, they show up specifically for that, the sort of diehard fans that show up specifically to hear new things by the next generation of composers. And then there are uh, people who, for whom it's their first time, maybe they listened to WNYC and they heard uh, a, a broadcast about Steve Reich's music and now they're at a concert and they're hearing something different than they expected. But the open-mindedness is always mind-boggling to me. I'm always surprised. Everyone's nervous about it feeling like an alienating gesture or inaccessible, and I've never actually experienced that. People are there to try something new. And at, the way I think of it most is that when you go to see a film, you also are seeing a premiere. You don't actually know what it's going to be. So you're taking a leap of faith that you're gonna maybe enjoy yourself, but that's not the only possible outcome. You may also be inspired to ask new questions or relate to your family and friends in a new way. And if that's what we can do in concert giving, that's, that's what makes a good program in my opinion. You've put together different art forms and, and multimedia. Is for for people who ask you what yeah. you do, do you do you have a, a way that you characterize a presentation like that? Do you have a name for it? Yeah. So if someone asks, "What do you do?" I st I start by saying, and it's interesting because of the name of the series. I start by saying, "I'm a classical percussionist." And if we continue the conversation, then I can elaborate and I can say that uh, I focus a hundred percent on the work of living composers. And so every piece that I play, I'm usually working directly with the composer. We're creating something together. And then I can, if someone's not a musician at all, I can say, well, you know that soundtrack to The Revenant? You know, then, then we can have a conversation about a composer we both know, or the soundtrack to The Mandalorian, or whatever. We can start to find common ground in pop culture or mainstream um, conventional sound making and, and popular music. And once that common ground is established, then it's not a mystery what I'm doing. <laughs> but initially, if I have to answer quickly, I still put that word in there, classical percussionist, um, and then their imagination might take them toward a timpanist in an orchestra or someone playing cymbals in Tchaikovsky or something like that. And I don't mind that as a slight mischaracterization because it is what I studied. That is where I come from. And now it's expanding in this new place, but that's just because that's where music is going too. Yeah. I'm curious about certain things that we either can or can't teach. You mentioned the body mm -hmm. and how we use it. I spoke a little bit about choreography or at least sequencing. What I'm getting at here is, regardless of the instrument, I've, I've had a lot of colleagues who have dealt with injury. Mm -hmm. I've had some colleagues who were percussionists who had extended periods of injury. Yeah. Yeah. For you as a teacher, are there ways that you can be aware or work with students to foster the best kind of overall wellness? 
It's, that's a, it's a great question. It's a really important topic. I take it extremely seriously. Um, and there's so many parts of percussion that could be, uh, that could injure you, and in, including uh, trauma. So just actually lifting things and dropping them on your hands and pinching fingers and elevators and doors. Percussionists have to move a lot of gear all the time. And so one of the first things we talk about, kind of like theater safety. You know, if you're a crew member on a film set or in a, in a theater, there's a lot of um, safety protocol. So that's one thing, is just really make sure that people are treating the instruments uh, and their bodies in relationship in a safe way. And then there's repetitive use, which is the main, main cause of so many injuries to small muscles. And in percussion, um, there's lots of ways to avoid it. And uh, one of the things that I reinforce in my teaching is to be open to new uh, technical approaches late in your career. So there are a lot, of, a lot of dogmatic percussion pedagogy practices which would say you should really hold your sticks in this way because that's, that can achieve these outcomes. And I find that that very prescribed path, that sort of dogma, has a lot of injury associated with it. If some people want to, I'm sure it's the same in string playing. I, I wouldn't know, but I'm curious to talk to string colleagues about it. If there's, a, there's this named grip for, for holding four mallets, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. And if a student comes to me and says, I really like this one better, probably that's their body telling them that this is what they should do. And with a careful like, observation of the way that they're holding their sticks and the relationship to the larger body, and then their body's relationship to um, not only safety, but just health and wellness, all these things in relationship form the core of pedagogy. So Ross, how did you uh, come to know that you have rhythm? Did you come from a musical family? I didn't come from a musical family, but my, my siblings and I all um, uh, were engaged in the local band program in Southern Michigan. Um, and specifically my neighbor, Larry Ochiltree, an excellent drum set player, was playing drum set when I was growing up. So I would fall asleep to this kind of muffled through set several walls um, drum set practice. And uh, that was a huge influence on where I wanted to go with with music. So when it comes time, like everybody does in junior high or elementary school, you're asked to pick an instrument for band class. Um, and I knew I wanted to do percussion. I don't think anyone knows that they have any inherent instincts or skill set in rhythm and pulse and, uh, and the relationship between those. Um, but over time, maybe you, you get told, hey, you have good time or your rhythm is good. And then you just start to go in that direction. That, that's what happened for me anyway. So. When did it really start to catch on for you? Like I said, the, the band program was, was a really good one. It was modest, but the teachers were incredible and really inspiring. So by the time I was at junior high, I was hooked. And I knew that this is, this is going to be the thing that I do, uh, at least as a hobby. And then in high school, I was lucky enough to go to places like uh, Interlock and Summer Camp. And, and that's a place where you say, oh, this other kid wants to do this for some, some sort of career that we don't know about yet. And so that realization eventually becomes the, your future. Um, and then coming here to where we are now at Oberlin uh, Conservatory, um, then, you're, then you're really in the space of everybody's very focused and committed on making this their life. And at that point, so that's a little bit of a point of no return. Absolutely happy to, to commit to it for the rest of, of my career. And finally, I'm curious to know, how what you do interacts with just your life in general. When you wake up in the morning, do you already have some sense of a rhythmic impulse or does that activate later? I mean, I've, yeah, I, I, do, do you live and breathe rhythm? I, I guess it could be yes or no, yes and no at the same time. I'm mostly externally influenced as an artist. Uh, so I don't find that I have um, uh, core art creative impulses that come from within. And, but my eyes are open, my ears are open, and as I'm you know, walking down the street or making an espresso or whatever the task is, some sort of sound is happening, and sometimes it creates an expression. It's a rhythm or it's a relationship of tones, and um, that's the nerdy part of, of what we do is that you hear that in every, every corner of, of your lifestyle. Uh, that's where I get my influence is in sort of everyday life external influences, but I also know people who have the spark of creativity, you know, upon waking up and, and it all comes from within and I admire them too. <laughs> That's just not me. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. It was really fascinating and I can't wait to hear 
some more of your performances. Thanks for having me. Thank you.